This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending our uh, uh, January in, on this cold day, Grand Rounds. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Michael Burke, who is an associate professor and R01 funded investigator here at, uh, at Emory. I think uh, all of us uh, know Mike, he works so hard. Um, I don't know how he balances having a family plus uh, doing CCU and clinical care, as well as uh, an R01 funded uh, research program in basic sciences. Um, and we know that, uh, as I was reading the training grant last night, we know that uh, Mike is very unique in that uh, not very many MDs go into uh, basic science and do research. So congratulations, uh, Mike. Um, he went to Jefferson Medical College uh, and then Northwestern for internal medicine and cardiology training, where he also did um, research training uh, in the ABIM pathway as a physician scientist studying mechanisms of heart failure. Uh, then he moved to Boston at Brigham and uh, did advanced heart failure fellowship and was a uh, postdoc there and on faculty at the VA and then moved to uh, Emory in 2016. Um, Dr. Burke has been studying uh, molecular and cellular mechanisms involved in heart failure, uh, has received many awards, including the prestigious J. N. Cohen Award from the Heart Failure Society of America. And um, today he's going to... Uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk um, because uh, he's going to uh, talk to us about cardiomyopathy genetics and the next generational uh, sequencing era, and also um, tell us about some of the clinical uh, care initiatives. Um, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Pooja, for that uh, overly kind uh, introduction. I'm going to be, like she said, talking about cardiomyopathy genetics. Um, now, this is a big topic, um, but what I'm going to do is try to focus on um, some recent advances, really, since the advent of next-gen sequencing at the tail end of the first decade of the 2000s. Um, and um, the, the impact that this has had on the cardiomyopathy world really can't be overstated. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump in here. For some reason, my slides are not advanced. Oh, there we go. Um, so I have no disclosures. And here were the learning objectives that were sent around in the email. Now, I'm going to start off with a somewhat brief genetics primer. I know if you're not thinking about this every day, it's good to have a little bit of a refresher and kind of put everybody on like a, a little baseline um, uh, where we can um, at least talk then about some of the more, more recent advances in cardiomyopathy. So first up, just some simple terms, a gene is the basic unit of heredity. The nucleic, uh, nucleic acid sequence defines the amino acids in your proteins, about 20,000 in the human genome. Genes are found on chromosomes, which are structural units of DNA. Importantly, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 total, 22 pairs of autosomes, one pair of sex chromosomes. And then another important term is an allele. This is a single copy of a gene that is encoded on a single chromosome. For the autosomes, because we have two pairs, we have pairs of these, you have two alleles or two copies of each gene, one on each chromosome. Then with the sex alleles, it's a little bit different. Women having two X, they have two copies of those genes and males only have one. Um, and then chromosomes, of course, when you put them all together, that's your genome, all the chromosomal DNA, uh, the human genome is about 3.1 billion base pairs. But here's just an interesting little caveat to make sure that we're all aware that there's a lot left to learn. Genes constitute less than 2% of the entirety of our genome. All right, now if we're talking about genetic diseases, we're talking about mutations. And there are three general classes of mutations. You have genome mutations where you have abnormal chromosomal segregation with cell division. Um, so these think like the trisomies. Um, and then there are chromosomal mutations where you can have a deletion or duplication of a big chunk of a chromosome. And then what we're talking about today are gene mutations. So these are nucleotide level changes within a specific gene. So. When we talk about gene mutations, there's three that I want to mention. Missense mutation is first. This is where one base pair is altered, and you swap one amino acid out for another one, as you see here with the original beta myosin heavy chain uh, mutation described by the Seidman lab 30 years ago. Then there are nonsense mutations. Now here, one base pair again is altered, 
But what you do now when you alter this base pair is you swap out an amino acid for a stop codon and you truncate the protein. Nothing comes after that. And those are usually somewhat deleterious. Last up, we have indels and frame shifts. And this is where one base is added or removed, uh, or more than one base. It can be a, a bunch of bases as well. But what happens is the entire genetic code gets thrown off. So if you look at this sentence down here, each of these words will call a codon in the genetic code. So if I suddenly add a base without taking anything away, all of a sudden the sentence makes no sense. And those are almost certainly going to be deleterious as well. They usually lead to premature stop codons at some point in time. All right, next up, I want to talk about a couple important concepts in genetics, which are critical to understanding everything that I'm going to talk about later on. So first up is inheritance. This is just the way in which genetic information is passed on, and you have autosomal, sex-linked, and mitochondrial types. So autosomal comes in two flavors, dominant and recessive. I'm sure many of you have heard those terms before. Autosomal dominant is by far the commonest mode of inheritance in the cardiomyopathy. And I think anything specifically that I'm talking about later on is going to be autosomal dominant, unless I say otherwise. So when we say autosomal dominant, we mean a single mutant allele is sufficient to cause the disease. And you can get this really in one of two ways. First of all, is the classic family history. It is passed on by one parent to their offspring. But you can also have a de novo mutation in the proband, and I think this is an important point if you're not dealing with genetic cardiomyopathies regularly, you absolutely can have a genetic disease without a family history. It has to start somewhere. And that, as an aside, brings up an important point about cardiomyopathy genetics, which is that most cardiomyopathy mutations are what we call private. That means that they're unique to that single individual or family. And that's particularly true in genes that are identified less frequently. Now, from a genetic counseling standpoint, with autosomal dominant disease, each offspring, each child has a 50% chance of receiving the mutant allele. So it's a coin flip whether or not those individuals are going to be at risk for disease. Then there's autosomal recessive. This is much more rare and both alleles have to be mutated in order to cause the disease. Next up, we have our sex-linked, of which the only one that matters for cardiomyopathy is X-linked. And again, if you think through this, it's, it's sort of logical. Men only have one X chromosome. So if they happen to get the damaged allele from mom, they are uniformly at risk of developing that disease. X-linked disease in females is usually less likely to occur, it's less severe when it does occur. Um, last point with X-linked is that, again, from a genetic counseling perspective, just think through this. There is no male-to-male -male transmission because men pass on their Y chromosome to their male offspring. Last, I just wanna briefly mention mitochondrial uh, inheritance. It's the last time we'll talk about mitochondrial diseases today. Now, mitochondria do have their own small genome. It is very important. We sometimes call this maternal inheritance because only the egg contributes mitochondria to the developing embryo. So from a genetic counseling standpoint, fathers cannot pass on the disease to their offspring. These are quite uncommon, but I just wanted to mention them because cardiomyopathy and to a less extent conduction disease are fairly common um, issues in, uh, in these disorders. All right, on to our next major concept, and this is really important for the entire rest of the talk, okay? The concept of penetrance and expressivity. So penetrance is the proportion of those with the mutant allele who will develop the phenotype, whereas expressivity is the variability of the phenotype once it is present. So the easiest way to remember this is penetrance is black and white. You either have the disease or you don't. Expressivity is the gray zone, okay? This is, does your patient have asymptomatic LV dysfunction with an EF 45%? Or is this the patient that's coming in with recurrent heart failure who happens to have an EF of 10%? Now, like I said, we're gonna come back to this topic multiple times throughout the talk, but what I want you to remember right now are these two facts. First up, the genotype positive, phenotype negative family members are at risk, but they do not have a disease and they shouldn't be made to feel that they do. It is also not inevitable, okay? Penetrance in the cardiac myopathies is almost uniformly incomplete, meaning that even if mom has the disease, it doesn't mean that her offspring absolutely will, even if they have the risk allele. 
their chances of developing the disease are much higher than the average population risk, but it's not a guarantee that they're going to get the disease. The other thing that this means is that genetic prevalence, so those who are walking around with a potentially pathogenic variant who are at risk, exceeds the prevalence of clinical disease. So we all have drilled into us four boards, keep that in mind, fellows, the HCM clinical prevalence is one in 500 individuals, but it turns out that the mutation prevalence in society is actually substantially higher, possibly even threefold higher, as you see here from this study. And interestingly, a fairly recent publication on ARBC shows almost the same ratio. Now, the last thing I want to cover in our primer section are a couple genetic analysis tools that we'll refer refer to throughout the talk. So the first is GWAS, Genome-Wide Association Study. This has been with us for about 20 years. It's a method for identifying an association between a genetic region and a specific phenotype or disease of interest. To do this, we measure things called SNPs. SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms, okay? These are relatively common minor variations. So what I mean is that for a particular SNP, maybe 1, 5, 10, 15%, of the population is carrying that particular SNP. They're not necessarily damaging. And in its simplest form, the way this works is this. So let's say you take a cohort of patients with DCM, and then you take a cohort of controls. If one of those you know, 100,000 SNPs that you measure happens to be much more prevalent in DCM versus control, that means that something in that genetic region is associated with the disease phenotype and might even be causal or contributory. Now, a critical thing to remember about GWAS is it only shows association. That's been a longstanding criticism. You don't get any functional insights without more research. But the way to make this clinically applicable, which is currently in vogue, is to do something called a polygenic risk score. These are on the cusp of being ready to go for coronary disease. In fact, there's already direct-to-consumer tests available for coronary disease. And I think these are coming down the line for, um, for cardiomyopathy as well. Um, the simple idea here is that if you take uh, the SNPs that are measured and associated with a disease, the more SNPs that someone has, the higher risk they have for either getting the disease or having the disease be worse than someone else that doesn't have those SNPs. All right, next up is next-gen sequencing. This is the thing that has absolutely revolutionized genetics, as I hope to show you over the rest of the talk. Almost overnight with next-gen sequencing, we in increased our ability to sequence by literally multiple orders of magnitude. So just consider this, okay? The Human Genome Project took 15 years and cost $2.1 billion to sequence a human genome. Now we can sequence a genome literally overnight in its entirety for a few hundred bucks, okay? It's also more sensitive, it's cheaper. Um, what we typically do in the research side of things is we'll do whole exome or whole genome sequencing, which is just what it sounds like. Exome sequencing is where you sequence all of the exons of all of the 20,000 odd genes and genome sequencing is you sequence the entire thing. Now, particularly relevant to us are exome panels. So an exome panel is kind of a curated set of genes, typically ones that are associated with a disease or a phenotype that you want to look at. And an exome panel is what we get when we do genetic testing, where they'll test, you know, 100 or 200 cardiomyopathy genes, okay? Um, there are certain advantages to that. I don't have the time to get into the, the details of that, though, today. All right, so quickly, before we get into the genetics of cardiomyopathies, I want to talk about a few little tidbits about interpreting genetics research so that you can be a little bit more of an informed reader. The first thing I want to do, though, is point this out, some genetic epidemiology for all of cardiology. These are the approximate prevalences of all of these different categories of potentially genetic diseases. When I'm talking about this, I'm only talking about monogenic diseases, so not polygenic stuff like coronary disease, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. When you add these numbers up, you could estimate that about one in 60 to 75 people who are walking around have some kind of inherited cardiovascular condition. I think that's a pretty mind-blowing number. Um, just consider that we have, what, 140, 140 faculty in our division. All right, now, one issue with genetics research you need to be aware about is bias is very important to understand. You have to understand where the bias is in your genetic studies, and it's 
in almost any genetic study that you read. The reason is disease specific cohorts are almost certainly going to have a higher genetic prevalence than population cohorts. But population cohorts in particular, which tend to take people that are kind of midlife, which is usually after the worst genetic disease has manifest and killed off some individuals, tends to have a significantly lower genetic prevalence. Just a quick example here, this is a study out of Pennsylvania, and they looked at the community health cohort from Geisinger, which is tens of thousands of patients. And in that study, 1% of the population had DCM. That is slightly higher than the estimated population prevalence of DCM. So it's not completely population representative, but it's not that far off. And what they found is if you had a Titan variant that was potentially damaging, only 7.5% of those people had DCM. Now, the odds ratio is still 11, so Titan is still causal in these individuals, but not everybody that has a Titan mutation has penetrant DCM. Now, if we look in the same study at the tertiary cohort, which was from the Penn Biobank, now we're looking at 7.5% of people having DCM, which is more than tenfold above the population prevalence. So this is clearly not at all a representative population. And lo and behold, here, they've got fourfold more DCM in people that have Titan mutations. So it's just a simple example of how your population biases your studies. It also influences your results. So in GWAS, you have to choose your population carefully. So this is a GWAS that was done looking at all comers with heart failure. So anybody that had any kind of heart failure. And you might, on the surface of this, look at this Manhattan plot, which is what these are called, and say, oh, this looks pretty good. We've got a lot of SNPs that are hits here. But when you dig into this, what you see is these are associated with CAD. These are associated with AFib. You can probably see where I'm going with this. This is associated with hypertension. This is associated with BMI, diabetes. So basically what you've done when you've taken all comers heart failure cohort is you identify the risk factors for heart failure. Not particularly helpful. There's actually only one SNP in this study that was significant that is actually most associated with DCM and LV chamber dilation, and that's the BAG3 locus over here. So this group did the same thing. They showed the same thing in their heart failure cohort, but what they did that was neat to prove this point is they restricted their heart failure cohort in a second GWAS down to just the non-ischemics. So when you do that, the CAD hits vanish. The AFib hit becomes significantly less profound. And then the BAG3 hit, which is the area that is associated with DCM, becomes statistically speaking, the most important SNP in the study and we identify another potential DCM positive hit. So again, your population matters a lot. Next up, what else matters within population is ethnicity. And as with most areas of medicine, we have a bit of a problem in genetics. This is data from the GWAS catalog. For those that aren't aware, for those of us that do big data science, um, the NIH now requires as a, um, a metric for funding, that if you do something that is big data, you have to deposit in a repository. And GWAS catalog is the one for GWAS. So this bar over here on the right side of the screen is the global population broken down as a relative percent of these different ethnic groups here. And what you can see, Europeans, which are basically white people, that's 16% of the global population. But Europeans constitute over 80% of all of the genetic data in the GWAS catalog. And unfortunately, the NGS data sets look fairly similar at this point. So ethnicity, does it actually matter in the cardiomyopathies? The answer is absolutely yes. This has been proven in many studies um, over many years. So in population cohorts, so people that don't have HCM, but where we can do next-gen sequencing, you can see that this is something that you could only do in the next-gen sequencing era when we can cheaply sequence thousands and thousands of exomes and genomes. So this looked at Framingham, which was European ancestry, Jackson Heart, which was predominantly African ancestry, and we see a twofold difference in the prevalence of potentially damaging HCM variants. Within HCM cohorts, so of the people that actually have HCM, again, you see a significant difference based on ancestry. We don't have good population studies in DCM because the good ones were pre tightened But within DCM cohorts, this is data from Ray Hirschberger's um, precision medicine study, which Alana was in charge of as our, at our site here. Again, we see a threefold difference in potentially damaging DCM variants between different ethnic groups. So ethnicity also matters. Put all of this together and defining a particular variant as pathogenic is actually kind of a challenge. 
Now I'm putting up this busy slide not for you to memorize anything here, but this is the ACMG's variant classification scheme. Anytime you send genetic testing and you get a variant back, it's going through this validation process. And there is one flaw that I will point out and others that talk about, other clinicians that talk about genetic party myopathy also point this out. And that is that the patient's phenotype is only considered supporting. I'm gonna show you evidence a little later on from the next gen sequencing era that statistically speaking, this is probably incorrect because VUSs in guaranteed um, known pathogenic genes are more likely to be likely pathogenic than not. And this probably will get elevated, at least I hope it will, in the next iteration of these guidelines. All right, so that is our primer. Um, and let's go ahead and jump into cardiomyopathies. So we're gonna start out with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because it's the more clearly defined genetic disease. Here's an old, old MRI of a patient of mine from probably 15 or 16 years ago. You can see the severe hypertrophy in this individual. All right, so the dogma that will be on boards, hint, hint, fellows, um, is that this is a monogenic disease of the sarcomere. There are eight definitive sarcomere genes that cause it. It is autosomal dominant, and the two predominant gene mutations are MYBPC3 and MYH7. Now, for any polygenic disease, and when I say polygenic, I mean a disease where more than one gene can be mutated and produce the same phenotype. Practically all of these diseases have what I call this long polygenic tail, where the data quality supporting those genes is, is variable. So for instance, these top three genes here have quite compelling data showing that they are likely pathogenic. It's just not quite to the level of the sarcomere genes. But as you get further down this list, some of the data is frankly outright dubious, and there's really a very weak association with HCM. The last thing I want to mention is don't forget the phenocopies. Fellows, you'll probably get one question about this on your boards. So a phenocopy, again, this is something that on your imaging test, it looks like it's HCM, but it's actually not. It's a metabolic cardiomyopathy. In genetic studies, we see that these come up clearly less than 3% of the time in HCM cohorts, but they're important to identify because they change your management. So the dogma in HCM has long been that this is a monogenic disease of the cardiac sarcomere. But let me show you some data that might call that into question. So coming back to our big concepts from early on, penetrance and expressivity. So penetrance, remember, that's black and white, whether or not you have the disease. And in HCM, it's uniformly age-dependent and it's incomplete. Even in referral cohorts, I told you earlier, these are ones where you're gonna be biased to have more genetic disease. HCM is penetrant only about 50% of the time by the time people make it into their mid thirties. If you know anything about HCM, the worst genetic disease tends to present around that time or before. In population cohorts, it's much less. This was from UK Biobank and the average age here was about 56, I wanna say. <clears throat> now, why do we have this variance? There's a lot of reasons. Genetics is actually pretty complex and this is something that that next-gen sequencing has showed us. So first of all, the disease-causing variant itself may impact your penetrance, i.e. a myosin head region mutation might be more pathogenic than one in the hinge region or in the tail region. There are also genetic modifiers. Genetic modifiers are ones that are mutations in different genes that in and of themselves don't cause a problem, but you add them on top of a sarcomere mutation and all of a sudden that it's enough to push that into oh, outright HCM. There are phenotypic modifiers with obesity and hypertension being the well-established ones, but we don't really know the mechanisms here. Gender, we also don't know the mechanism here, but almost uniformly in all cardiomyopathies that are genetic in origin, men are substantially more affected than women. Ethnicity, we talked about before, and then one that's not well fleshed out that I am absolutely certain plays a role are environmental factors as well. So now let's flip over to expressivity. Expressivity, remember, is the gray zone. How severe is the phenotype? Well, many of these same modifiers also influence your expressivity and make it highly variable. But where this is really best shown is when you look at people that have the same mutation. So a founder mutation is a mutation that's passed on down the generations for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. So you can have a fairly large cohort in these studies of individuals who all have the same 
same variant, and you see wildly different manifestations of those diseases, telling you it's not just the mutation that dictates how severe your disease is. This is even better shown in a couple of small but recent monozygotic twin studies. So not only do these individuals have the exact same um, variant of interest, they have the exact same genome. And oftentimes they're being raised in the exact same environment, and yet they have variable expressivity. So that is the norm in HCM. So back to our dogma, but I'm saying we've got incomplete penetrance and highly variable expressivity. So now I'm going to add in more data from next-gen sequencing, stuff that would not have been possible before we had next-gen sequencing. And the first concept I want to introduce is something called burden testing. So this is the idea that, well, so the idea here is that the prevalence of a variant in the general population provides insights into its pathogenicity. So I think the easiest way to illustrate this is for me to show you a figure. So over here, you've got an HCM cohort with potentially pathogenic variants, and then you have a population cohort in gray here. The idea is that if you have far more hits in your genes there, um, than you have in the population, that gene is likely causal or at least contributory to that disease phenotype. So burden testing is never going to definitively 100% prove causality, but the statistical power with which we can do this, looking at thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of genomes now, is extraordinarily powerful. The other thing that it can't do that I will point out is it can't disprove causality. But here, let's look at this. So with HCM, we confirm the pathogenicity of the eight sarcomere genes. Let me eliminate these just to show you the two common ones. So what you can see is there's a tremendous burden of potentially pathogenic variants in the HCM cohort over the population cohort, suggesting that these are contributing to the disease process. Now, when you look at that putative tail, the genes where I said some of the data might actually be outright dubious, virtually none of those genes, unfortunately, show a variance above that seen in the general population. So if they do cause HCM for real, it is exceedingly, exceedingly rare. As I said before, most mutations in the cardiomyopathies are private. So if that's the case, these are going to be very hard to prove causal, and they're not going to be clinically actionable on genetic testing. They're all going to come back as VUSs. Now, the flip side of this, and I alluded to this earlier when I showed the ACMG variant classification scheme, is that in the definitive disease genes, VUSs are likely pathogenic even without other key criteria. The phenotype is the key there. If you have the classic phenotype and you have a mutation in one of the rare HCM genes, like let's say ACTC1, which doesn't come up all that often in genetic testing, that patient has clear-cut HCM and they have a variant that's potentially damaging on the in silico testing and they call it a VUS, you can call up the genetic testing company and get them to change that to a likely pathogenic variant. Now, burden testing, where it also has great impact, is framing our mind as to what we can expect from genetic testing on the whole. So with burden testing, this is a very large multinational cohort, ethnically diverse, which is surprising for a genetic study. 30 to 40% of HCM is explained by the sarcomere genes and the metabolic cardiomyopathy genes. That leaves 60% unexplained. So what is the impact of this for genetic testing? Well, this is critical to understand. This yield is unlikely to change. Why? Remember, what we're doing doing with next-gen sequencing, we're sequencing the entire exome or the entire genome. We're looking at all the genes. We are now not missing a gene that we didn't think about before that makes up 10, 20, 30 percent of this pie. So what we can say right now based on burden testing is that if you send genetic testing on someone with HCM, the yield on average is going to be about 40 percent. It'll be a little lower in sporadic disease, a little bit higher in familial disease. But this is not going to change for the foreseeable future, not until at least we get into non-coding variants, which is something down the line in the future. So what does this mean on genetic testing? Well, this group did a follow-up study to this to show what it means. So if you take a cohort of HCM and you do an exome panel of, I think they did like 60-odd genes in this study, 99% of the pathogenic variants come back in the sarcomere and metabolic genes. In those putative genes, literally 0.5% come back pathogenic. The rest are VUSs or benign. 
So those genes add virtually nothing to the genetic testing report. So just got to keep that in mind. You're not likely to see hits in those other genes. So the dogma is that this is a monogenic disease of the sarcomere. And I will, let me pause for a second and say, I have a review article in Jack that was published like eight or nine years ago. And I think I used that exact sentence, but things have changed. So mea culpa there. So it's a monogenic disease of the sarcomere. We have incomplete penetrance and highly variable expressivity. And a genetic diagnosis now I'm telling you can only be made 40% of the time. And I don't expect that to change right now. So what's going on here? This actually suggests a complex genetic architecture, and that indeed is actually what is going on. So there were two landmark studies published now almost three years ago in Nature Genetics. To me, these two studies are the most important genetic studies in HCM since the original Seidman Lab report in 1889 and 90, um, showing the uh, myosin heavy chain mutation. So let's dig into this for a moment. So HCM uh, GWAS was done in one of the studies, 1,700 patients. You can see the PLP variants fell right in that 30 to 40% range. And what they show is that common variations, so that polygenic background drives your HCM expressivity, drives the HCM severity. So they put together a polygenic risk score. And essentially what this shows is the more variants an individual had that were associated with HCM, the thicker their LV wall was, highly statistically significant. The more variants an individual had, the more likely they were to suffer an HCM-specific adverse event. In the other study, they did a larger GWAS, again, PLP variant right in that 30 to 40% range. But what they did, because the study was big enough, they took sarcomere gene mutation positive folks and compared them to gene negative cohorts to better tease out this polygenic component. So the first thing they show confirms the prior study, and that shows that common variation drives HCM expressivity. So again, the severity of disease in both cohorts. So that means if you have a classic MYH7 mutation that you know is pathogenic in this person, their polygenic background still influences how severe their disease phenotype will be. But the common variants seem to play a greater role in sarcomere negative disease. Now, in this study, they also had family members of the patients in this particular GWAS, and that allowed them to put together a second polygenic risk score to predict HCFs. So now we're talking about penetrance or whether or not somebody will get the disease. And once again, the more common SNPs that someone had predicted with high likelihood whether or not that individual would later develop HCM. So this could be a way for us to predict for individual family members on genetic counseling in the future, whether or not we think they're gonna get it or not. Very impactful studies. So if we summarize genetics as a whole, when we're talking about a gen monogenic disorder, what we mean is that the allele frequency here is very rare in the population, but that particular variant has an outsized effect on your phenotype, a very large effect. When we zoom over to polygenic disease, these are variants that are minor variants, meaning that there are still a minority of individuals in the population, and any one of them alone has very little effect on your phenotype, oftentimes not measurable effect on your phenotype, but what we're showing is in aggregate, they, they can have a cumulative effect. So for the last time, the dogma that is now gone for HCM is that this is a monogenic disease of the sarcomere. What we now know is HCM is a complex genetic disease that has both monogenic and polygenic forms of inheritance. All right. The last thing I want to show on this, because it was just too cool not to show, this is also from these nature genetic papers. So what about things that might make it more likely? What are the risk factors that drive this genetic background to produce HCM? Well, they did something called a Mendelian randomization, which I'm not going to get into the details of because we don't have the time. But basically, you can infer causality of particular risk factors based on your genetic background with Mendelian randomization. And what they showed is that diastolic hypertension in particular is a major risk factor, particularly over here for sarcomere negative HCM. So that automatically 
brings to my mind whether or not blood pressure becomes a target for prevention or regression of HCM. And I really could not summarize this better than the way the authors did a very elegant statement in their discussion. They say the strong association with hypertension raises the possibility that sarcomere negative HCM may represent in part, an exaggerated response to hypertension in genetically susceptible individuals. Very powerful, very cool finding, all brought about by these new technologies. All right, let's go ahead and jump into DCM. This is what we're dealing with um, uh, pretty much every day in the heart failure world. You can see this 9.9 .9 centimeter ventricle with thin walls. This guy just got bad a couple weeks ago. So DCM genetics are very different than the other cardiomyopathic processes. The, the genetic background in DCM is very variable. Many different gene ontologies, i.e. we're hitting different parts of the cell and mutations in different pathways in the cell can still cause the same phenotype. Now, just like HCM, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Only a handful of these are actually pathogenic. They, are all, uh, they all have incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. Up to half of DCM is familial. So when we're saying DCM, what I'm referring to are non-ischemic disease. Okay. Now we can't go through a talk with DCM genetics without at least briefly talking about Titan and Lamin. So let me go ahead and do that. Titan, the largest protein in the body, 33 to 34,000 amino acids. You can see it here in the orange, and it plays a critical role in structure and function of the contracting sarcomere. So not surprising that mutations could cause disease. Now, ground zero for this was this paper by the Seidman Lab at the end of 2012, which showed that Titan was causal for DCM. This was a disease that was waiting for next-gen sequencing to come along. The Titan gene is absolutely massive, and it's also highly repetitive, particularly in the A and I band regions, which makes it hard and not very cost-effective to sequence via Sanger sequencing. So yet another advantage to next-gen sequencing has been the ability to easily check the Titan gene. Now, the prevalence data, if you are just scanning papers periodically, might seem like they're all over the map, but there's some consistencies there when you pull these data together. It's less common in sporadic disease. It's more common in familial disease. It's very rare in kids. This is really a disease that takes its time to develop. But all comers, we can say that Titan makes up about 17 to 18% of non-ischemic DCM. But please keep in mind, these are only only the truncating variants, which always make up a minority of the overall potentially damaging missense rare variants that you get in a particular uh, cohort of patients. So what about other mutations in Titan? Well, they're hard to adjudicate, um, but recently, so that th this is another paper from the side in the lab. I can tell you they worked on this for probably eight or nine years. They were working on this uh, way back when I was in their lab and it only got published about two years ago. Titan splice site variants make up about one to 2% of all cases of DCM. So now when you add that to this, we're talking about a 20% rate of Titan mutations in all cases of DCM. But the big kahuna is whether or not we can identify type missense mutations. There are clearly a handful of studies that show that these are pathogenic in specific families. The problem is this gene is so big, and this has been shown in population studies, what I'm about to say. The probability, and um, that by statistical chance, is that all of us, everybody on this call right now, has one to two very rare variants in the type G. So how to adjudicate those is a very hard thing. This is an active area of research. If I had to guess, I'd say maybe this is another 5%. But if we add five more percent on here, we're talking about Titan being the cause of fully one quarter non-ischemic disease. All right, next up, I want to mention Lamin. And I really want to hammer home just how pathogenic this disease is. Um, I will tell you in doing my CMP exams either this year or last year, there were actually a couple questions on lamins. So this is also going to be important, I think, for boards. This was the commonest cause of DCM prior to Titan. You see the old New England Journal paper from the Seidman lab here. It accounts for about 6% of DCM cases, and it comes with a lot of ancillary features, although it can be seen in isolation. Now, one of the important things from a genetic counseling standpoint is lamin is just about the most penetrant of all of the the genetic cardiomyopathy. So this is one where if I'm seeing a patient's family, I tell them, yeah, you are likely to get this disease. Now let's look at some of these complications. So conduction disorders are quite common. Importantly, they can present before DCM. Don't just think that it's sarcoidosis. 
Um, a third of patients with DCM will have ACE AV block if their mutation is a lambda mutation, and it's highly progressive, as you can see here. In a median of follow-up of seven years, two-thirds of patients had AV block, with over a third of them having the kind that would net you a pacemaker. The other issue with laminar are arrhythmias, a massive burden of both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, which are tough to treat. Just to put this in perspective for you, the annual ventricular event rate in lamin cardiomyopathy is about 5% per year. Look at what it is for these other disorders where we use ICDs with regularity, non-ischemics with the lowest EFs, 2% per year. ARBC, where we're always worried about making sure we don't miss VT, 5% per year. High-risk HCM, where we've long-standing had a debate over what the threshold is for putting in an ICD. So there are studies of primary prevention ICDs. These are all non-randomized data, but they are pretty compelling. So if you look at primary prevention ICDs put in, in people that have lamin cardiomyopathy, they have a, up to 50% shock rate at five years follow-up. For those without sustained arrhythmias, 80% have NSVT, and up to a third of these people will have it when the EF is normal. So this is a significant part of the guidelines. Um, let me just show these real quick. So in the ICD guidelines, in patients with a lamin cardiomyopathy, we look for four risk factors. The first is the presence of NSVT. The EF cutoff is 45, not 35. And we're talking also about non missense mutations, which are things like truncations. And then men have the disease much worse than women. And in those cases, you are within your rights to a classification to put in a primary prophylaxis defibrillator. In the pacemaker guidelines, we also have the recommendation that if you're going to put in a pacemaker, you should consider putting in a dual chamber defibrillator. That also goes for lamin. Um, a primary prevention ICDs. Usually we favor putting in a dual chamber ICD because the risk of both conduction disease and arrhythmias is so high. So if you know you need to treat one, it's likely you're going to need to treat the other in the near future. So just put in the dual chamber device up front. All right. Now, another major thing that next-gen sequencing has given us are natural history studies. This is only possible in an era where we can sequence thousands of people, particularly tens and hundreds of thousands of controls. So when we look at a genetic diagnosis in non-ischemic disease versus a non-genetic diagnosis, overall, even though survival data are mixed, it seems that genetic diagnoses come with a slightly worse course. Of course, when you're seeing the patient in front of you, you wanna know whether or not that specific gene mutation matters. So again, we'll talk about Titan solely because it's so prevalent. Um, but you know, there was early word that Titan was actually worse, but the balance of the data lately shows that Titan is actually not significantly worse than garden variety DCM. Now, mind you, garden variety DCM still comes with a very poor um, natural history, right? A very poor prognosis. Now, the one genetic cardiomyopathy right now that is clearly unequivocally terrible, and you really should make sure you don't miss this, is lamin. It's clearly worse in every single risk factor. And in particular, we see these people um, progress on to end-stage heart failure fairly frequently. There are a bunch of other DCM natural history studies. I'm not going to cover them in the interest of time. But the point here is that these natural history studies, which are permitted by next-gen sequencing, will hopefully start to open up avenues where we can tease out the differences in these genes and start to have more nuanced or more precise care for these individuals, like we now do for lamin. Now, what else about big data um, can we learn um, on DCM? Well, you can do burden testing. I'm not going to belabor the point here. This is the same idea as we did with HCM. And burden testing also confirms your most frequent disease genes. So here's Titan and Lamin highlighted. Once again, to refresh your memory, a much higher burden of potentially pathogenic variants in the DCM cohort over the population cohort. Strongly suggestive that these disease, these genes are causal in DCM. Just like HCM though, those putative genes usually return VUSs. They are not terribly helpful on clinical genetic testing. Also, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but just like with HCM, when we look at DCM GWAS, we do see a strong polygenic component probably underlies DCM as well. Those need to be refined a little bit more, in my opinion, but there's clearly a polygenic component to DCM. 
Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll mention this. So um, this study, this comes from those nature genetic studies. And I think this is a really, really cool finding from an intellectual and research standpoint. So oops, um, there we go. So they looked at HCMG wasps and DCMG wasps, and they compared them. And what they found is most of the SNPs that were associated with both diseases were the same, but they had the opposite direction of effect. So what I mean by that is if there was a SNP that made it more likely that someone would get HCM, that same SNP would make it less likely that individual would get DCM. So what this highlights is something that my lab has been focusing on for years, which is that shared pathways exist in the cardiomyopathies, but their direction of effect, their direction of activation, the consequences, and consequently, the phenotype is different. Um, our lab has done a lot of work in that area. That was actually some of my publications dating back to when I was a fellow. And the cool thing about that, because we were doing that in animal models, is that Patrick Eleanor's group just published a study of RNA-seq data in human hearts with DCM and HCM and showed exactly the same effect as we did. All right, um, let me briefly cover these other forms of cardiomyopathy because I always get questions about these in genetic talks. So as we know, um, when you have non-ischemic disease, historically we broke it down into idiopathic, a lot of which is now DC, is genetic, and then the secondary forms, these other potential causes of DCM. And what we're finding over the last five to seven years is many of these have a genetic predisposition as well. So peripartum disease, people have known it familial clustering for years, but now that we can sequence thousands of patients in peripartum cohorts, we're finding very clearly that there is a genetic substrate that exists for at least a proportion of these individuals. Alcohol-induced cardiomyopathy, exact same thing. Now, alcohol cardiomyopathy is defined as greater than 80 grams per day, every day, for more than five years. That's a lot of alcohol. And that's also a lot of history taking to make sure that you're actually defining whether or not the patients have that much alcohol. I will say in this study, I give them credit. They did a good job at defining that. But they recognized, I think, that this is not always easy to do. So they came up with a more moderate metric, which was excess alcohol defined as greater than 24 grams per day. Now, I'm not sure why they chose that cut point, but I suspect it might have to do with this. So if you look at the standard size drink for wine, beer, or liquor, that's 14 grams per day. So if you double that and you're drinking just two a day, which I think most people would call moderate drinking, they call that quote unquote excess alcohol. And in those individuals, Titan was a modifier, meaning that it was more likely that you would develop DCM down the line if you consistently drank that much alcohol. Genetic-wise, we see the same thing in chemocardiomyopathy, and probably where it's most well-developed is in acute myocarditis. Oh, by the way, up to 20% of myocarditis cases had familial DCM. We probably need to think about that when we see those individuals. Next up, ARVC. This could be its own grand rounds, um, which I'm only going to give it one slide. Um, but classically, we think about this as a desmosomal gene that affects the right ventricle. But what we've known for a while now is that LV involvement in classic ARVC is actually the norm on our imaging studies. In fact, ARVC-like features can be found in the LV without classic RV involvement, and certain genes that are confirmed unquestioned DCM genes can sometimes in rare cases present with classic ARVC. Here's a study of patients with ARVC with these different gene mutations, and it shows you the prevalence of a reduced LV. EF. So all this is to say that current guidelines, both the um, arrhythmia guidelines as well as the um, uh, heart failure guidelines, now favor the term arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy as an overarching umbrella for a subset of diseases, which include DCM with a lot of arrhythmias, channelopathies, and ARVC as the specific right ventricular variant. Last up, we have what I call phenotypic variants. So non-compaction and restriction. So LV non-compaction, the more we learn, the less we know. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but keep in mind a few caveats here, okay? The prevalence totally depends on your imaging modality. We really haven't fully defined what we think this means, or at least there's not consensus on whether or not our definition is accurate. But the other thing that bothers me as to whether or not this is truly pathologic is that it's frequently found in normal individuals, in particular in athletes who we would think would have the healthiest hearts. Also, there are a host of case reports in the literature, so I'll have them there, um, where it can be transient. LV non-compaction can actually come and go in the same patient. 
So what does the genetics tell us? Well, there are many genes that are associated, but really where the genetics helps us is when we look at big family pedigrees of LV non-compaction probands. And what you see almost invariably is that other family members usually have DCM without non-compaction. So to me, LV non-compaction is really a phenotypic variant on the DCM spectrum. It's not a standalone cardiomyopathy, and that is defined as such in the genetic cardiomyopathy guidelines. Restriction, not to beat a dead horse here, it's the same thing except with HCM. When you look at big pedigrees of restrictive cardiomyopathy or inherited restrictive disease, you typically will see other family members that have classic HCM. This is more, most frequently found with these particular disease genes, troponin I and myosin heavy gene. It's important to note because these patients do white really poorly. You should probably think about getting them over to um, us in the heart failure but world, but restrictive cardiomyopathy to me, not a standalone genetic disease. All right, so that is a lot of data. Let me try to summarize this all in one slide. So we have DCM and HCM. We have the phenocopies, which are outside the bubble because they're not really HCM. But both of these diseases have their myopathic and syndromic forms. Both of them have their kind of extreme phenotypic variant. Both of them overlap with mitochondrial diseases. And we also have that arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy that overlaps with the channelopathies. But the thing that I think is really important for you to keep in mind, and that is a relatively new thought, in the cardiomyopathies that all of this sits on this strong polygenic background that influences your disease phenotype. All right, so genetics is complex, but there are things that we all can do right now. So let me just tell you what you can do and what I think is coming down the line. So genetic testing in HCM is very useful. There's a lot of uses for it. First of all, it is a key component of familial counseling. And um, I'm actually on the HCM guideline writing committee. And as you know, all of these um, new guidelines that are coming out have this top 10 take home points. So our number three take home point for HCM is that counseling of the family members is actually an absolutely essential component to HCM care. And that is something that can easily be facilitated with genetic testing. Genetic testing is also prognostic. This is data from the SHARE registry. Sarcomere positive patients get disease earlier and they have a more severe phenotype. When you get a positive variant, you can also do cascade genetic testing in family members. And this has been shown in the pre-NGS era to be cost effective. Lastly, genetic testing can help confirm the diagnosis if it's in doubt, such as someone that also has concomitant hypertension. And importantly, it can identify those rare metabolic cardiomyopathy. So this is straight out of the HCM guidelines, but this is also how I think of DCM. Let me just walk you through what you do if you order a genetic test in case you decide to start doing this. So if you get a pathogenic variant in your patient, you recommend cascade testing for that variant in the families. The variant negative individuals don't need any more testing. Their risk of developing HCM or DCM falls back to the standard population prevalence for those diseases. Now, if you have a VUS or it's benign, they need to continue to go lifelong clinical surveillance. This does not mean they don't have a genetic disease. And then every couple of years, we like to do variant re-evaluation or reclassification. The company actually does this for you. You just have to watch out for an email saying, oh, you know, we got this variant that was reclassified. I've gotten a couple of those over the year. But really the big thing is that this negative genetic testing eliminates the need for lifelong testing. That's where the cost savings become. It's also relief of the psychological burden on some of the family members. I have seen a couple of family members who felt like this was gonna be inevitable that actually sank into depression, even though they didn't have a disease. These are all of the class one guidelines. I'm not gonna read all of them in the interest of time, but there are nine class one recs regarding genetic counseling and genetic testing in the HCM guidelines. The last part I wanna mention about HCM is um, with Larry's help a couple years ago, I was able to lead this effort to get HCM elevated as a tier one genomic application via the CDC. So this is a fairly big thing for the CDC to do. And this is also important at the population level because basically what this is saying is the CDC recognizes that HCM is a genetic condition that warrants genetic testing in the vast majority of individuals. It makes it a little bit hard for payers to deny genetic coverage when the CDC lists something as a tier one application. 
Now in DCM, the story is kind of the same. It's prognostic. I've already shown you that before. You can do cascade testing. That is also cost effective. And it's really important that you identify lamin because that changes your management. So in Ray Hirschberg's genetic cardiomyopathy guidelines from 2018, it now is recommended that DCM on average should be tested in everybody. And I agree with that recommendation. I was a little bit disappointed when the new heart failure guidelines came out with a somewhat more muted um, response or really a muted, not response, but a muted set of definitions for what to do with genetic testing in DCM. They kept saying selected patients without really defining this very well, although there was that table that they had in there to try to um, suggest to you um, who should be done. So personally, I think you can do DCM genetic testing in anyone that doesn't have a clear cut clear-cut cause for their cardiomyopathy. But who are these selected patients? Don't miss the patients with arrhythmias or family history of sudden death. And the skeletal myopathy and syndromic features as well, those are patients that you want to be able to get to. All right, last up, let me tell you what I think is coming down the line just very quickly. So first of all, the old model of single gene discovery is really um, going by the wayside, okay? These are not going to impact a lot of people, even and, and they're pretty cumbersome tests. So yes, you may help that one individual family, but it's not going to contribute much at the societal level because burden testing shows us these new genes that we discover are not going to contribute much to the prevalence of genetic HCM. Now at the bench, a lot is going on right now. We're trying to define gene-specific pathways. We're trying to understand the role of other cells in the heart. My lab, this is probably 90% of what we do in my lab right now, is understanding gene-specific pathways and the roles of other cell types in genetic cardiomyopathies. Another big thing is to figure out whether somatic gene mutations, which have recently been established as causal in cancer, also play a role in the cardiomyopathies. So what I mean by somatic is a cell that was terminally differentiated. So everything that we've talked about today are germline mutations. That means the mutation was there at conception or very early embryologically, and it spread as the cells divided into all of the cells in your body. What I mean by somatic mutations is once cells are terminally differentiated, oftentimes they're still dividing, right? You know, a terminally differentiated cell in the heart still needs to grow that cell, that heart, from the size of a pea when it's early in embryology to the size of a, um, you know, an infant heart at birth. So those cells are still dividing. So if you get a mutation in one of those cells while they're terminally differentiated, you may have a subset of cells in the heart, the, the cells that are the derivatives of that particular cell with the mutation that have a mutation. And we don't know whether or not they contribute to cardiomyopathy. So I'm Working with a group at MGH that's actually studying this now, they have some of our uh, LVAD4 samples up there. And then we need to understand the role of non-coding variants. Again, that's 98% of the genome. At the population level, we clearly need to improve diversity in our cohorts, as there's uh, more, I think, to be discovered there at the single gene level. And then we also need to understand the role of modifiers. All right. Last slide here, what is coming down the pike at us maybe by the end of this decade? Well, I think the risk prediction tools are going to be the big ones. The natural history studies are coming out pretty steadily. Hopefully that will help us define some of these disorders. And then polygenic risk scores that we talked about before will also, I think, come online for the cardiomyopathies later on this decade. But I think a big question is whether or not we can get more precise with our therapies. You know, I was a site PI here for Realm DCM, which was a Lamin study. It wound up failing, although patients, um, for, its, for its primary endpoint, um, although patients felt better when they took the drug. But let's consider this schema, if you will, right? So genetic variants cause altered gene networks. Those gene networks are what causes the remodeling and systemic consequences and leads to morbidity and mortality. Now, our disease model ought to hit here at the gene networks, but that's never what any of our therapies have done. They've all hit these systemic and downstream consequences. We're starting to get wise to this, right? We've got Mavicampton now that hits gene networks. And hopefully in the next decade, we're going to have newer technologies like RNA interference and gene editing technologies that will also contribute, maybe even help out with prevention, although that's kind of high in the sky down the road. All right, well, thank you for listening in. I wanna thank a few people here you can see on the slide, but I also wanna point out 
um, where I'm located most of the time and my email address. I like thinking about genetics, so feel free to um, shoot cases by me if you have a genetic testing report, attach it to the email so I can look over the report. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. That was just outstanding. A really masterful presentation. And, uh, you know, you took a very complex area and made it digestible for us. And I certainly appreciate that you started off with a genetics primer. Um, so we've got some questions here. I saw one question uh, from uh, Dr. Sperling in the chat. Um, do, do you want to unmute or do you want me to read it? You, I, you can go for it, Pooja. Okay, great. Um, so, Mike, outstanding presentation, a tour de force. The Mendelian randomization data in HCM related to diastolic hypertension is valuable. Are there specific populations globally that have a notable founder mutation for HCM? And also, can you share uh, about um, HCM being classified as one of only two cardiovascular genetic conditions by the CDC? Yeah. So first with the, the founder mutations, yes, there are a bunch of founder mutations. There's um, a big one in um, the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands has one of the best um, studies, uh, national cohort studies. And um, there's another big, big one in Iceland, which is also a nice isolated genetics cohort. Um, I actually, uh, the, the, the Iceland cohort, that was done through the Seidman lab when I was there, and I did all the genetic testing for that. And what those founder mutations show, why they're so valuable, is it shows how variable the expressivity is, even when you have the exact same gene mutation. So it highlights just how important it is, the rest of the milieu that we live in, um, that drives whether or not we get disease. Um, so with regard to the um, CDC, let me see if I can go back on my slides here to what Dr. Sperling is referencing. So um, CDC tier one genomic in, um, applications, there, there's only a handful of these that have been identified, although there's probably more coming down the line as we learn more and more about genetics. But um, as Dr. Sperling mentioned, it's only um, HCM and FH that are CDC tier one genomic applications. So what this means at the population levels, the CDC is essentially giving you the stamp of approval to say this is a clear genetic disease that requires genetic-based testing and, and diagnostics. So it's helpful um, both at the level of recognition in the community that this is a, a disease that warrants some degree of genetic testing. And I think where it's also helpful is kind of influencing payers. You know, it's a little bit, like I said earlier, it's a little bit hard to deny someone getting genetic testing for HCM when um, this is a, a tier one genomic application. Bob Taylor, if I remember correctly, lamin phosphorylation changes in aging, which alters function in the vasculature. Are there kinase or phosphatase mutations that cause lamin-related cardiomyopathies? Um, that is a great question. Um, I, I would have to check the individual mutations. There are a couple of them. Um, it is sometimes hard to model these things uh, genetically. So the Seidman lab actually had a clear-cut genetic mutation in lamin that really was not a very robust mouse model, unfortunately. Um, but where those lamin pathways actually hit, it's not entirely clear. Now, the, the drug hits P38 MAP kinase, um, the drug that was used in the Realm DCM study. So lamin mutations definitely alter inter, uh, intracellular signaling pathways. Um, personally, I thought the P38 MAP kinase was too... Um, it's a two central a nodal molecule. You know, it's it's a, an active nodal player in more than just lamin. So I thought it was a bit uh, of a reach to think that that was going to wind up being um, a positive trial. But there, whether the lamin mutations actually directly affect like kinase um, um, function or phosphatase mutations, I'd have to I'd have to look specifically. Mike, since we have um, so many patients with HCM, because I know we're one of the centers for that and also for for just heart failure, are we going to have a genetics 
clinic within cardiology and where are we with that? And if not, what are what are you guys currently doing? Are you sending them to genetics or? Um, well, I can't answer for Robbie or Oslam as to what they're doing in the HCM clinic. Um, the big thing with the genetics clinic is you really got to have a genetics counselor um, to do that because the, the second visit is actually even longer than the first oftentimes. And, you know, we'd be slotted to see these patients for 15 minutes otherwise as clinicians. So um, right now, I'm hopeful that we'll get uh, a genetics program up and running at some point soon. I know Bob is actively recruiting um, to see if we can can bring in a genetics person. Um, to be honest, I think what you need for a genetics program is multiple people. Um, the genetics world in cardiology is very siloed. The coronary people do coronary stuff. The vascular people do their aortopathies and the cardiomyopathy folks do cardiomyopathy only. You know, if you ask me questions specifically about coronary um, genetics, I wouldn't be able to tell you too much, certainly not to the level of detail I can with the cardiomyopathies. So we're looking into that. Hopefully it's something that we'll be able to offer soon. Um, I know some of my colleagues in heart failure, when they have uh, uh, someone that they send genetic testing on, they have occasionally been referring them to genetics. Um, you know, it'd be nice if we could bring that all under one roof, I think, because then the patient has one-stop shopping. Uh, we're going to make sure that we get all the appropriate follow-up tests because we're going to be more diligent, I think, than a geneticist at making sure someone gets the clinical screening they need with echoes and ECGs and whatnot. Um, and a lot of these diseases, you can also um, make justification for doing MRI. In fact, in the HCM guidelines in 2020, we gave class one RECs to MRI almost across the board for almost all HCM patients. So there's a lot that can be done for those individuals. What I do personally when I send it inpatient, you know, I don't send it on as many people just because it's too cumbersome to do without a genetics counselor to help you out. But I just do the genetics counseling myself. When I was a Fellow actually at Northwestern, I did um, my continuity clinic was in the HCM clinic in the Chowdhury. So, for better or for worse, I saw more HCM than uh, CAD as a fellow. And um, I got very good at genetic counseling because we also didn't have a genetic counselor uh, back in those days. And I was, I was the genetic counselor basically for our clinic. Great. All right. Um, thank you so much. I know we're, we're uh, past uh, time. If anybody has any questions, I know Mike is available after. Um, and uh, thank you again, everyone. Don't forget to get your CME and I'll see you next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.